So chemical modification of RNA was a topic that basically was kind of put forth by Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman quite a number of years now in a series of really nice papers that I'd recommend to you. And what they showed was that modification of mRNA with different modified bases, especially with pseudouridine, reduced bindings to innate immune sensors in vitro, it reduced toxicity, it prolonged the expression in cells, and it increased translation in vitro. And so for quite a while, pseudouridine has kind of been um, the most popular modification in, in, the, in the arsenal. So because Trilink offers over 200 modified NTPs, we wanted to ask, well, can we find other modified bases that have desirable biological properties? So we embarked on a, a project where we synthesized new, numerous naturally occurring and unnatural uh, modified NTPs. And um, we asked, can we identify an analog that's superior or equivalent or superior to pseudouridine. Um, and so we put these modified bases into a couple different templates. So originally we started off with EGFP and luciferase. And the most prom promising modifications were tested in additional sequence contexts. So the first thing we did was to measure whether or not they could be incorporated with T7 polymerase, because if the polymerase won't take them, then it's not going to be very useful. And so that eliminated a bunch of, of NTPs. Um, then we measured their translational capacity in an in vitro translation system, and then in six different cultured cell lines. And um, later we have examined the effect of sequence engineering on transcription yield, quality, and the immunogenicity of these transfected mRNAs. This is just a smattering of some of the um, different modified bases that we tried. Um, we tried a, a bunch more in, in addition to this. And so here's the, the case study of um, what the results were. Um, with these messenger RNAs. So first, the in vitro translation. So this is a translation in a rabbit reticulocyte lysate. Um, and you can see that wild type, so A, C, G, and U, um, wasn't the one that was translated the most efficiently in these lysates. In fact, uh, pseudouridine was translated at a, a much higher rate in the rat, rabbit reticulocyte than uh, wild type RNA, which is sort of surprising because this is the, in, the substrate of the ribosome. So there must be something more going on. And we think actually has, has to do with the immunogenicity. We tested these in a number of different cell types. Um, this was a really nice collaboration with Joel Jesse at MTI Global STEM, which is now part of Thermo. Um, and they use their uh, Global STEM mRNA in reagent, which is a cationic lipid nanoparticle. And so when you're thinking about the results of this, might think, okay, well, I told you earlier that delivery is important. You might not compare these results directly to, say, an electroporation. Okay, so this is with the lipid nanoparticle. And I, this is some of the data, and there's a lot of data here, and I don't need you to go into detail. But I want to make some really simple points here. One point is that if you go along the different cell types, the pattern of which modifications are tolerated is different. So this cell is much less permissive than, say, this cell type. Okay, so permissiveness to different nu nucleic uh, acid modifications is dependent on the cell type. And this first example here I'm telling you about is in the GFP sequence context. So we made the whole series that we would made in GFP and we now put it into luciferase. If you just take a look at this picture and contrast it with the next one, what we found was that the pattern was different. Okay, so there's a sequence context effect and now a cell type context effect. So we started asking ourselves, well, what's different between these two, um, between these two primary sequence contexts? And we noticed that EGFP had very few um, number of contiguous uridine ring residues. And so we wondered whether or not that might be part of the answer. And so um, we were in the middle of doing this study where we're kind of screening through a number of different pseudo-U um, homologs. And um, we made some interesting observations. So these get bigger as you kind of go down the, the row here. And we found that if you look at just the, the, the first bars, the dark bars, that as we went to larger sizes, the ability to incorporate um, into the transcript was diminished. However, if we, and, but in EGFP, which has fewer uridines, we saw that we could incorporate some of these larger modifications into GFP that were not incorporated into luciferase. 
And so then we ask the question, if we depleted the uridines in the cruciferase sequence by using substitution of synonymous codons, would that improve the incorporation? And you can see if you now look at the, the blue, lighter blue bars, that we are indeed, so this is in with, with lots of uridines, and this is with ferro-uridines again here, that we could change the incorporation based on depleting the sequence of uridines. And this is something that um, other people in the field have looked at. Um, for example, CureVac has published some papers that using something that they call GC enrichment, which it's not exactly the same thing, but gives you basically the same result. You're, you're enriching for Gs and Cs, you're depleting for Qs, right? Um, and they, they see some interesting things along the way. I suggest you read some papers. All right, so here is just a bioanalyzer trace where you can see that this mom um, substitution was not easily incorporated at all, but now when we uh, do the uridine depletion, we can now incorporate this larger modification. Now, when we looked in wheat germ extracts, we saw that uridine depletion here on the right-hand side versus the left-hand side gave us more activity. So we, where we were seeing no activity here, in the, we were seeing some activity here. Um, but when we looked in cell culture, we saw really dramatic effects. So here on the left is non-uridine depleted, and here on the right is uridine depleted. And we had to cut the scale in order to be able to put them both on the same bar. And so we saw significant improvements in activity upon uridine depletion of the sequences. And you can see here that you know a lot of these sequences, so here's pseudo-U now. And we actually have things that are working better than pseudo-U. We know N1-methyl-pseudo-U has always also been reported in the literature. But we have other things like 5-methoxy-U, which is also working really well in a uridine depleted context. All right, so next I want to give you a little case study of a, that we did with Matt Porteous's lab at Stanford. Uh, so Matt Porteous is one of the uh, one of the first people who did genome engineering experiments way back with uh, David Baltimore um, using zinc finger nucleases. And so we did a nice collaboration with him where we looked at uh, Cas9 and put different modified bases into a standard Cas9 or a uridine depleted Cas9 sequence. So the standard Cas9 sequence we'd gotten from our collaborator Feng Zhang and it's a sequence that many of you might be using. Um, and then the uridine depleted sequence we removed as many uridines as we could. These were electroporated into CD34 positive primary human T cells or primary cells. Um, and then we measured indel formation using what's called a tide analysis. And again, this is in collaboration with Matt. And so here you can see a series of different modifications, and we're comparing it to a ribonuclear particle delivering a guide strand. And again, you can see that when we um, uridine deplete the sequences, we get higher activity. Interestingly, in this sequence context, we see that wild type RNA, which doesn't always behave well in other you know, contexts, was working as well as 5 methoxy U and pseudo uridine this context. Now, this may be because we're electroporating the construct. I'm not sure. Um, but this was what the observation was here. You can see this is wild type when it's not uridine depleted. Um, and the pseudo U was pretty good either way. So uridine depletion seemed to help um, the, the wild type and also the 5 methoxy U were improved by uridine depletion. So, some conclusions about the chemical modification section is that in vitro translation does not correlate with cell activity. And so that suggests that there's another layer on top of that, and we think that that is, has to do with innate immune activation. Primary sequence selection um, is important for uh, optimal chemical modification. And we found in a number of different contexts that uridine depletion um, frequently improves incorporation by T7 polymerase, as well as um, their yield and quality, and that in numerous sequence contexts, we found that uridine depletion um, in the combination with 5-methoxyuridine yields high cell activity, low toxicity, and reduced interferon. In the context of CD34 positive cells that have been electroporated, um, uridine depleted Cas9 mRNAs, the wild type pseudouridine and 5-methoxyu RNAs all yielded similar indel rates. Um, and I just want to make the caveat that I'm not saying that that would necessarily be true if you were doing a lipid transfection with the exact same constructs. We didn't test that. So I think delivery context also matters. Okay.
So another case study here is on the optimization of mRNA purification. So why are we purifying the messenger RNA? We're trying to get rid of you know, a lot of the ingredients in the process, like salts, NTPs, cap analogs, the proteins that were used in the reaction, truncated mRNA products, residual DNA, and we think that the removal of double-stranded RNA can be really important. Traditional approaches such as silica membrane purification or precipitation um, are, you know, what people have generally used. Um, but scalable purification may be the hardest part of this whole puzzle, um, how to do that. Making the mRNA is actually not all that hard. Um, so we've done up to gram scale um, syntheses uh, and purifications using silica membrane um, techniques, and, but I don't think we really want to go past about a gram. Um, and so we thought, well, most commercial biomolecule production relies on process chromatography. And so we evaluated a large number of different chromatography approaches. We have one that we call LCI isolation, which is good at removing residual proteins, DNA, and NTPs, but not really double-stranded RNA. Um, we have another process, which is a reverse phase HPLC that can be pretty good at removing double-stranded RNA, and it enriches for full long length RNA. It becomes challenging as you get to longer sequences, and we're currently spending a significant amount of effort working on purification and trying for finding alternative approaches. This is just an example of what a um, bioanalyzer trace looks like before and after an HPLC purification. So the blue is prior. You see you get this extra stuff here and some stuff on the back side. And we can make that cleaner um, by doing HPLC. Now, we have a method for measuring the double-stranded RNA, which was uh, adapted from a method published by Katie Carrico. This is a slot blot using a, an antibody called J2, which is uh, specific for double-stranded RNA. And uh, you can see that here there's just different dilutions of the same sample that upon HPLC purification, we're you know, fairly dramatically diminishing the amount of double-stranded RNA. And here, this is pseudo. And that has effects on activities. So here, in, um, this is in uh, THP1 cell, which is a monocyte cell line that's been differentiated. And you can see that HPLC purification of wild-type RNAs um, gives a significant increase in the activity. Same is true with pseudo-U. Interestingly, and kind of repeatedly, we see that um, the HPLC purification of 5-methoxyuridine RNAs does not seem to significantly increase their activity. And one potential theory for why that might be is that we postulate that possibly these pattern recognition receptors may not efficiently bind 5-methoxy-U double-stranded RNA. We have yet to show that biochemically. Um, here's the interferon. Um, response, you can see that HPLC purification, so I, I should back up. This is a, a, a reporter cell line that responds to interferon signaling by secreting a secreted marker that you can observe. And so you can see that HPLC purification of wild-type RNAs pretty dramatically reduces the amount of interferon signaling to about the baseline. That's also the case with pseudo-U, but again, there's no difference between 5-methoxy-U, HPLC purified, and see this fairly consistently. So the conclusions for this section are that um, for some, some applications, you may not need to do, um, you know, really sophisticated purification, especially if you're using um, a U-depleted 5-methoxy-U substituted RNA, or if you're potentially doing a vaccine and you want some immunogenicity. Um, for other applications, a two-step process might be more desirable, where you're removing the um, double-stranded RNA. Um, and that reduces interferon responses in THP1 cells. Um, I want to caution you a little bit that when you're selecting your synthesis scale, a lot of people forget to account for the fact that you don't get 100% back from anything. Right? And so you want to factor in when you're choosing your synthesis scale that you're going to lose material and have an idea of what your worst case you know, yield off your purification would be and factor that into your planning, um, which many people do not do until they go down to the point where They've already told the people with the money what it's going to cost, and now they have to go back and find out what's going to cost them. No one likes that. All right, so think about what your purification is. All right. So as we get towards the end here a little bit, I wanted to do a case study of the effects of mRNA capping on activity in vitro and in vivo. 
So we have these wonderful tools with CleanCap that allows us to make all kinds of different caps. And so we started making some. And so in this study, we compared CAP0, CAP1, and M6A CAP. To make everything the same, we actually produced CAP0 not with ARCA, but using a CAP0 clean cap. So you can produce any of the different cap forms with, with clean cap. So we, to make them all the same, we produced all of these using clean cap. And we did 5-methoxyuridine uh, RNAs and HPLC purified wild type RNAs. Uh, and then we looked at luciferase levels at 6 and 24 hours by um, removing the liver and doing western blots on the protein. And this was a really nice collaboration uh, with the group at Arcturus Therapeutics. Um, and so these were done with their lipid nanopore. Next, All right, so I mentioned that, you know, there's this interesting um, modification on the cap that's present about 30% of the time um, that uh, seems to modulate stability and uh, translational initiation. And so this is one of the interesting ones we wanted to look at. And this is what the data looks like. So this is data in mice at six hours and 24 hours. And the first thing you can see is that the CAP0 RNAs um, express really poorly um, in mouse hepatocytes. Um, the second conclusion is that the CAP1 mRNAs produce are, are better. And then we were really pleasantly surprised to see that we got an increase in activity with this M6A RNA, M6AM RNA at 24 hours. And so um, this is really encouraging to us. We saw something slightly differently when we used 5-methoxyuridine um, modified RNAs that were not HPLC purified. We saw initially that, well, we saw that CAP0 again was a stinker um, and that CAP1 was better. In this case, at six hours, CAP1 was better than M6AM, but there seemed to be a difference in the kinetics of decay of these two with the M6AM catching up at 24 hours. And so we're interested in the idea of whether or not the M6AM cap may lead to a longer persistence of the mRNA in the cell, um, but we haven't actually directly asked that question yet. Um, all right. So the next thing we asked, said, well, can we come up with some more mechanistic explanations for why this M6AM may be behaving differently? And so we have a nice collaboration with Sammy Jaffrey at Cornell and Mike Collegian at Rutgers, and we made some um, some oligonucleotides with different bases at the end for them, um, which we capped with P32 so that we could follow them in decapping reactions. And so this is the, the first experiment. So DCP2 is one of the predominant decapping enzymes in the cell, although there are others. And um, the first thing I wanted to want to point out to you, this is kind of a, a big data set, but what we did was we looked at every dinucleotide at the first position with M6AM. So AA, AC, AG, AU. And then we looked at those as CAP0, CAP1, and CAP2. Right? So first thing to point out is that if you look at this guy, so this one does not have an M6AM. It's just an AG, which is our preferred clean cap sequence, um, our first generation. And you can compare that directly to this one because it's CAP1, just like this one, but and it's AG, but this one has differs only by the N6 position being different. And you can see that the decapping is less, which is desirable. So in this, less decapping is better. So it appears that this cap is more stable than this one, despite having the same AG dinucleotide. And there was a pattern, and when we looked at this, and I'm only showing you one decapping enzyme, but we looked at others, where AA was good and AG seemed to be good. And that seemed to kind of go along through the whole, whole set, with the possible exception. And so we're wondering whether or not the reason why these things are giving higher expression in vivo might be because they're being decapped more slowly. Um, and so the other thing we noticed was that AG, out of all the combinations, was the most important in terms of the rate of decapping. And so nature seems to care not only about what the first nucleotide is, but also what the second one is. And we don't know about the last one I'm going to show you here is two other decapping enzymes, NUDT12 and DXO. And interestingly, these don't decap CAP1 or CAP2. They exclusively decap CAP0. And so these are probably scavenger enzymes that are, you know, 
getting rid of byproducts in the cell, but they may be also getting rid of viral RNAs that don't possess their capital M structure. And so we thought this is all kind of interesting. So the conclusions for this section are that um, CAP1 and M6A capped RNAs are more active than CAP0 RNAs in vivo. Um, the CAP M6A cap alters the activity in vivo, and we're curious as to whether it may extend the persistence of these capped RNAs. We found that M6AMG RNAs are decapped more slowly than AMG RNAs, and that the second nucleotide, the second cap proximal nucleotide, influences the rate of DCP2 mediated decapping, and that M6AMG displayed the lowest decapping rates for all the cap forms that we tested. And then lastly, there's some decapping enzymes that seem to selectively decap cap zero. So what does cap do to it? And the answer to that is we have no idea. Um, so uh, we invite you to, to uh, get cap two RNAs from us. We, we know that nature must think this is important because 50% of, of eukaryotic mRNAs possess cap two. What is it doing? Is it cell-specific expression, temporal expression? know, cell cycle response, stress response, we just don't know. Uh, so very early days, we've only been able to make these RNAs efficiently only recently. And so we're currently working with collaborators to try to work out exactly what CAP2s are. But uh, stay tuned and maybe next year we'll tell you more. Maybe you guys will be presenting some things at this meeting next year on what CAP2s